Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Radical Candor Podcast. I'm Kim Scott, the co-founder of Radical Candor and Just Work. And I'm Jason Rosoff, CEO and co-founder of Radical Candor. And I'm Amy Sandler, your host for the Radical Candor Podcast. So you've likely heard about the Great Resignation, and perhaps you're even one of the millions of people who have bid their jobs farewell over the past few months. So what is driving this mass exodus of mid-level workers from companies far and wide? Well, in our research, we've discovered, you guessed it, bad bosses, as well as a lack of transparency and a lack of a clear career trajectory. Overall poor communication, these are the things causing people to resign at record rates. In fact, according to the predictive index, the number one skill that employees are feeling their manager is lacking is effective communication which I thought was interesting. It jumped up or maybe down from number five as the fifth most important skill or the fifth skill people are lacking to actually the top skill, number one this year. So on today's episode, let's talk about a few radical candor strategies that can help. Kim, hearing this data, thinking about it, what is the first thing companies and managers can do to increase engagement and retain talent? Make sure that they don't have shitty bosses. People join your company and they leave their boss. Uh, So in all seriousness, job number one that you've got is that you've got to treat everyone who works for you as a human being. This means actually talking to people about everything from their career goals to how they like to work. Only when you get to know your direct reports well enough to know why they care about their work and what they hope to get out of their careers and also where they are at the present moment in time. Only when you really understand these things about the people who work for you can you put the right people in the right roles and assign the right projects to the right people. Yeah, it can seem sort of trite, but it's important to remember that just everyone is everyone is different and especially right now, everyone is probably different than how they would be if we weren't in a global pandemic. That's why it's so important to actually treat each member of your team individually. And sometimes when things are out of control, it's very tempting to try to like fit everyone and everything into a very specific mold. But unfortunately, that means you're going to miss out on a lot of important details. Uh, about what is going to work for someone in terms of how to support them. So I know that some managers out there uh, got really nervous as we transitioned into the into the pandemic into a largely remote environment, and they started checking in with their team members all the time to see how they were doing. And for some team members, that probably felt supportive, but for a lot of other team members, it probably felt like surveillance. <laughs> uh, and so we just need to remember that not all of our even well-intentioned behaviors uh, are going to work equally well for everyone. And so if you have a primarily distributed team, you might want to think about how to schedule one-on-one meetings in a way that actually works for each of your team members. And that might mean that for you know one team member, so maybe for Amy, it's checking in a couple of times a week. And for Brandy, it's checking in once a week on Friday. That still works uh, best for her. Yeah. And Jason, I'm, I'm curious as you're reflecting, having led us through the pandemic and reflecting on now, you know, from March, 2020 to we're recording this now just at the beginning of November, 2021, we had to make a lot of changes and you were really strategic in how you looked at it. And I'm curious as you reflect back on where you were March, 2020, and especially in terms of how you communicated with our very small team of, you know, four full-time members um, to where we are now, like any insights you want to share with the listeners about how your, your thinking process has changed and evolved? One, there's something to know about me before I give the rest of the context, which is that I enjoy change. I thrive in an environment that where things are changing rapidly, and I want to recognize that everything else that I'm about to say is biased by that by the fact that like I enjoy change and experimentation, and so it didn't scare me when this big change happened and we had to figure stuff out. And so a lot of what I did was experimentation. So we added some different sort of communication mechanisms, like we added a staff meeting where we were regularly meeting internally. We spent extra time checking in with one another on how things were going. And we changed, so we we scheduled more sort of official one-on-ones as opposed to more ad hoc one-on-ones. We dialed up and down some different sort of modes and methods of communication over the course of the pandemic. We also added tools like Slack. We didn't have that before as a way for us to kind of keep in touch synchronously, even when we weren't uh, in a high bandwidth environment. And what 
I've observed is not only do our individual preferences differ, but what we need is sort of context dependent, right? It, both on the task and on the environment in which we find ourselves. And so for some tasks, it's far better for us, you know, Amy, you and I to get on a video call together and go through something. Mm -hmm. Let, let's say we're present, we're preparing uh, a, a sort of customization for a client. That's far better to do high bandwidth where you can show me the deck, we can talk through very specific things than it is to try to you send me the deck and I send you some feedback like that wouldn't work very well for you. But Nora, who's not on, on these, so the audience hasn't gotten an opportunity to meet her. For her, a lot of the time, like a quick bit of feedback in Slack is all she needs in order to, she's got everything in order to be able to be ready to go. So Not feedback in Slack, surely, but a quick note well, in Slack. Well, I would say right? feedback it's, in it's uh, criticism on work. And, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. No, 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 okay. I'm not talking about, <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. Good, good, good point. Yes. By the way, that was Tim uh, Scott, your feedback referee, clarifying. <laughs> <laughs> Surely, Jason. <laughs> and stop surely calling me back. surely. Yes. Go ahead, Jason. Oh, no. And so I, I think what I would say is what I've comment learned. In, comment in Slack, I think is what you meant to say. <laughs> I, I feel like I can't move past that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm over it. I'm over it. <laughs> um, I, I, Jason, are you are you over it? How are you feeling right now? What's going on for you? I felt fine with feedback, but I, I feel like I really... I have noticed that it requires a lot of adaptability. The way that I think about that is it requires a lot of attention to the skill of management. That is how I have felt over the course of pandemic, is in order to be successful, I have to focus on my management skills, like my ability to communicate, connect, and direct the work that the team is doing. But a lot of people don't necessarily have that same feeling of, this is exciting, I'm going to learn something new. They, they're like very afraid, actually. And it is in that fear that we often wind up doing things like setting up a system that works really well for us, but does not take into account at all the person on the other side of the screen or the phone. And one of the things that Kim says about effective communication. Again, you know, if you've been listening to these podcasts, you know, there's a lot of dentistry going around and that effective <laughs> communication is like brushing and flossing. And so, Kim, can you, I know there's this idea of career conversations and understanding career goals and this idea of, you know, rock star mode or growth mode. Can you talk about modes and how you think about career conversations? Sure, absolutely. So, very often, especially at big companies, when they when they try to think about the things they're going to do for employees to help them grow in their careers in the way they want, they call it talent planning. So first of all, I object to the word talent because it sounds very fixed mindset. But anyway, when you're planning, when you're helping to plan empl your employees' careers, very often people use a performance potential matrix. The word potential is exactly the wrong word because potential is prone to bias and potential is also, there's just no such thing as a low potential human being. So no manager should mark, in my opinion, their employee low potential. There's just, that, that doesn't exist for human beings. We all have great potential. So when I was at Apple, I really was, was grateful to, to work with Scott Forstall, who led the iOS team. And he changed that whole performance potential thing at Apple. And he said, words matter. We're going to talk about growth and what kind of growth trajectory people are on. And sometimes people are on a steep growth trajectory and other times in, in their career, people are on a more gradual growth trajectory. And so we call this superstar superstar mode or rock star mode. And it's really important to think clearly about the difference between superstar mode and rock star mode and not to be lazy and label people as superstars or rock stars because we're, we're all of us are in different modes at different points in our careers. So when a person is in superstar mode, they are gunning for the next job. They want your job or they want your boss's job or they want to be Steve Jobs. They're very ambitious and they want to do the next thing as soon as possible. Whereas when a person is in rock star mode, that person is doing a great job. They are the force, the bulwark of stability on your team. And if you don't screw it up, they will continue to do a great job and continue to be a force for stability on your team as long as you don't 
get in their way. And I think very often managers mismanage people when they're in superstar mode or rock star mode. So sometimes a manager will clip the wings of people when they're in superstar mode. They're, they're sort of afraid that that person is going to outstrip them. And you know what? If you have someone on your team who's going to go off and, and do something different than you are or, or, you know, get a promotion beyond where you are, that is awesome. That is all good. You should never clip that person's wings. And other times people don't respect those who are in rock star mode. And this is a mistake I'm ashamed to say that I made for too much of my career until I myself was in rock star mode. Like there are times in everyone's life when stuff is going on uh, in life uh, and it may be an artistic project, it may be family stuff, it may be a health issue for yourself or someone you care about, you know, maybe you're starting a family, whatever, but there's something else going on in your life. And so you're not necessarily gunning for the next big job, but you are still great at the job you're doing, making a valuable contribution. So I think it's really important if managers realize and, and ex- realize explicitly that some people are in superstar mode. And when they are, the things you need to do are you need to help plan their promotion path. You need to make sure they have a strong bench because they're not going to be around very long. So they need to be free to leave. You need to make sure that they are, that they're growing. Whereas when when people are in rock star mode, you, you don't want to promote them. That's not a reward. It can be a punishment. In fact, I knew someone who was starting a family and they had just they they had decided to start a family when they were at a moment in their career when they were great at their job and they could do their job sort of almost in their sleep but they were still great at it, it was, they were making a valuable contribution and as soon as that child was born their boss came to them and said I'm going to promote you and they said I don't want a promotion and the boss said well too bad. And that person quit that job, you know, that, that, and that company lost a valuable contributor. So you, you don't want to promote them necessarily, but you do want to honor their work. You want to give them high ratings. If you have a, a rating system, you want to give them great bonuses. If you have a bonus system and you want to establish them as the person to learn, learn from, they, they have a particular skill or expertise that they can teach others. That maybe wanted more than you wanted to know about no, well, rock star it, it mode feels, and superstar it, mode. Well, first of all, to be clear, because you like to say rock of Gibraltar, not Bruce Springsteen, so be clear on, <laughs> yes. the, on the rock star. Um, <laughs> but it, it feels very relevant. I was in a workshop recently where someone shared when we were going through praise and the importance of specific and sincere praise. And, you know, it doesn't need to be for a huge thing. It can be, you know, the email that you sent or speaking up in that meeting. And there was a comment in the chat and so many people responded to it of just feeling like, and I would say maybe folks that are in rock star mode or sort of the day in, day out contributions aren't recognized. I think that's exactly right. Well, and I, I think this goes back to getting to know your team members and highlights the importance of, of actually having structured conversations where you get to know where people are and where they are trying to go right? Like there's no better way to know this than to ask. Although, you know, speaking of that, too many managers are, are sort of operating from a place of fear. A lot, I have spoken to managers, people I've coached who say, I'm afraid to ask this person what their career ambitions are because I'm worried they're going to tell me it's something that I can't give them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is a very common response. And in fact, one of the things that I learned in my career about how to have career conversations, I learned from Russ Laraway, who uh, I worked with at Google and, and who I started a company with uh, before Jason, you and I started this company. And there's basically three different conversations that every leader should have with each of their direct reports at least once a year. The first is around sort of a life story conversation. So starting with kindergarten, tell me about your life. And don't force the person to start with kindergarten if they're like some people would rather poke a sharp stick in their eye than tell their boss about their childhood. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to start with childhood, but maybe it starts with grad school or wherever they're comfortable starting. And the goal of this conversation is to sort of listen to the person and understand, notice sort of pivots that they made in the course of their life and ask some additional questions to understand like why they made why they made those pivots 
And the reason why you want to understand why they made those pivots is it's from those questions that you'll understand what really motivates a person at work. At the end of that conversation, you can sort of write down, here are the top three or four things that I heard you tell me about what motivates you at work and give the person an opportunity. You know, maybe you got it wrong. Maybe you misunderstood something. Yeah. Give, the, give the person, this is a conversation, right, that the two of you are going to have. So that's conversation number one. That's a conversation you can have in 45 minutes with someone. It doesn't need to be this huge, long thing. And you can have it instead of a regular one-on-one. So I'm not trying to add a lot of meetings to your calendar because I know everybody is sick of meetings. So that's number one. The second conversation, which you can also have in a one-on-one slot, maybe a couple of weeks later, is about the future. So if conversation number one is about the past and what motivates someone at work as a general rule, conversation number two is about the future. Like, tell me about your dreams. You're, imagine that you're at the height of your career and everything is going the way you want it to go. Your life is what you want it to be. What does it look like? And ask people to give you three or four different versions of their dreams because, and, and this is, it's, this is important. I like to say, tell me about your dreams rather than your career, because very often when you say career, people think career ladder and they start thinking very sort of corporate-y about it. And that tends to not be such a fun conversation. But talking to someone about their dreams, to me, is a more fun and interesting conversation. And when you talk to them about their dreams, the reason why you want to get three or four different dreams is that a wise man once told me that only about 3% of us know what we want to be when we grow up and they confuse the hell out of the rest of us. So don't put too much pressure on the person to know exactly. Imagine yourself, imagine your life. And this is where, as Jason said, people tend to get afraid. So, so Russ had a good story about a, a woman on his team who was selling double-click ad servers, but what she really wanted to do was own and operate a spirulina farm. <laughs> so spirulina is a kind of high-protein algae. And so that sounded pretty different. It was kind of, at first, Russ had that moment of fear that Jason described, like, how in the hell do... do how do I get her to spirulina? <laughs> Yeah. What's the bridge from DoubleClick ad server to Spirulina Farm? But as they kept talking, they had the third conversation. And the third conversation is really about what are the skills you need to develop in order to take a step in the direction of your dreams. And they realized that one of the most important skills she needed to de develop was management skills. And so that allowed her and Russ to sort of reassess her job and to figure out she should stop doing some of the analytical projects she was working on and she should take on a bigger team and, and get more management uh, experience. And now all of a sudden, this job that seemed irrelevant to her real dream was quite relevant and much more meaningful. So that's an example of sort of understanding. And I would say she was sort of in rock star mode. She was really great at her job, but it wasn't, it was, she did not necessarily want the next big promotion uh, to double click ad server seller extraordinaire. She, she wanted the spirulina farm, but she did want to continue to do the job for a while because she needed the money and because she was good at it. Yeah. And just to say, um, thank you for that sharing around career conversations. And Russ Laraway, um, he actually has a book coming out next summer. It's called When They Win, You Win. Being a great manager is simpler than you think. And we'll go ahead and put the link to pre-order it in the show notes so you can get out ahead of the curve. And, and do pre-order it. Those pre-orders matter, and this is going to be a great book. Awesome. So, Kim, I was really struck by what you were saying, even of threading that needle from double click to the Spirulina farm and these kind of being a good manager skills. And Jason, I was curious as you were hearing that story, what came up for you on how, as a, as a good manager, how can you kind of thread the needle between the dreams and what the work is? How do you decide I can make a connection here to what they're doing versus, gosh, maybe this isn't the right fit for where they are? How do, how do you think about that? The biggest differentiator in my mind is, is this person doing well in the role that they currently have? And if they are doing well in the role they currently have, there's almost always, you almost always have the ability to build a bridge <laughs> between these things because usually the way you build a bridge is by stretching, right? Like by stretching them into some new skill, some new opportunity. It's a lot harder when the person is underperforming in the role. And then you're trying to figure out, 
can I resituate this person someplace else in the organization where they will be able to perform better? And that might be more aligned with their ultimate goal. And I I remember there's a person that I, I worked with a couple of jobs ago that was very much in sort of in search mode. Like they, they just didn't quite know what they wanted to do. And they were sort of serially experimenting (laughs) and he was struggling a little bit in that role that he was currently in. And we were trying to figure out like, what, what is it that's stopping you from just kicking butt in your current role? Why does it feel like it's out of reach? And through conversations very similar to these, essentially what we discovered was like, there is a passion and an interest in people management and less of a passion and interest in sort of like the details of the product and things like that. And their job was about 50, 50 (laughs) people and product. And I was like, well, I mean, that's the problem. Like 50% of your job, you're sort of like kind of, he was trying, but it was, his heart wasn't in it. You know what I'm saying? Like it just wasn't something that was exciting to him. And what he really wanted to do was lead a really big team. That was his ambition. And so I said, well, can we change the role that you're currently in in order to find a path where you can do more of what you're interested in? My hope is perform better as a result. And it actually wasn't that hard because we had other people who were really excited about stepping up into leading more of the work. And so essentially the, the, the answer was part of his job became somebody else's promotion. <laughs> And he got to focus on the skills that really mattered to him. And we didn't lose momentum. In fact, we gained momentum as a result of shifting these responsibilities around because the person who got the product responsibilities was so excited about it that they were putting in an incredible amount of effort and they were super effective. And he got to focus more on this sort of management trajectory. And so even in that situation where I was like, I wasn't sure how that was going to play out, it was actually not as hard as I thought to find a path. And that's because when you think about career opportunities, if you're doing this well, if you're, if you're brushing and flossing, you actually can connect the dots and say like, Oh, this person's deficit or the place where they don't want to focus is this person's opportunity, right? This other person's opportunity. If I can, I can actually create a win-win situation. I can elevate both of their potential growth by create, by shifting around these responsibilities. And so that was in my mind, was like proof positive. Uh, like I, I read this after <laughs> I did that. And it was such a interesting thing to reflect back on and say like, wow, th- it would be really helpful to have this framework in mind because I, I had to like figure that out the hard way <laughs> without it. And so even though there are t- points where I was nervous, I was just very glad that I actually worked through the both. What do you really want to do? What are you really good at now? And how can we f- find a place for you that makes that work? So, Amy, this analogy is for you. I'm going to shift away from dentistry and into yoga. It's kind of like it's kind of like doing the tree pose, right? I'm very flexible, but I do not have good balance. But you make a lot of tiny little adjustments in order to stay standing in tree pose. And so in order to remain still, you're moving a lot of little things in your body. And I think when you're a manager, once you've had these career conversations with people, there are a lot of little things you can shift that may not look look so dramatic, but it's what enables you to grow like a tree and to help your people grow like trees. Kim, I there feel you go. so seen and heard with your <laughs> yoga reference. Thank you. And uh, no, seriously, and I, I do think having different metaphors and different frameworks is helpful. And so I do, I, I really appreciate that. And what's funny is as you were sharing about the tree pose, I'm thinking about this foundation, these very slight, very subtle adjustments. And yet underneath you is this kind of stable ground that you're standing on as you're making these adjustments. And so, you know, needing this foundation of psychological safety, what Amy Edmondson would describe as, you know, feeling heard and acknowledged versus fear. Cause I just want to bring in Jason, what you were sharing about somebody might be afraid that they don't have the right role, or they might be afraid, gosh, this person's going to get promoted into my role. And so I think especially in this environment where there's so much uncertainty and humans (laughs) do not like uncertainty and the ground underneath us might not feel as solid. Jason, do you want to pick up on this idea of psychological safety and also all the, you know, all the research we're seeing now about how companies can contribute to mental wellness and overall well-being? Like, how are you as a manager contributing to more of a a level of foundation of safety and wellness. 
I, I want to play up the this idea of showing genuine interest in what the people who you work with are interested in as a great way to build a foundation of psychological <laughs> safety. I mean, we're all the most interesting characters in our own stories, right? So when someone else shows genuine interest, oh, Jason. curiosity. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's talk about the yoga and the tree pose a little more. <laughs> exactly. When someone shows genuine interest and curiosity in us, it makes us feel safer, feel better understood. And we actually, and not just feel that way, we actually are better understood. (laughs) That's the real advantage. And and so the career conversations are important, but I want to say like the basic skills of radical candor, the sort of like ongoing developmental conversations that we're having are also an incredibly important foundation for these things. We had someone who, a company that we worked with that sent out a survey after a bunch of their managers went through our workshop. And one of the responses they got back was, I can see a total change in my manager. I went from barely speaking to this person, uh, from him being very condescending to me, to meeting with me on a regular basis. The relationship is completely improved. I went from being uncertain about my future uh, at the company, now being confident that I can fulfill my career goals here. And it was that total change was not because that person's personality changed fundamentally. It is not because that person's job changed fundamentally. That person made a series of small adjustments in the way that they were in the interest that they were showing in this other person. They made a commitment to be kind and clear when they gave this person feedback and to really listen to the things that they had to say. These were a series of small adjustments, but the, the total impact of those small adjustments is an entire change in the relationship. And I just think that that's a really, I think a lot of people hear psychological safety. Uh, and, and I know Amy writes a lot about this to try to dispel this mythology that it's some huge shift. No, it's actually the series of small adjustments that we can make and how we talk to one another and how we listen to one another that wind up making the biggest impact and how safe we feel. And just to bring this back to the great resignation, I mean, as, as you said, Amy, Amy Sandler, not Amy Edmondson. Yeah. As you said, Amy, earlier, the reason is it's the boss, stupid. Like, bosses are behaving like assholes. Frankly, we, I think you were yeah. the one who uh, okay. was using the stupid and the asshole. Uh, okay, yeah. sorry. I'm going to, to go back to what you, you said, and I paraphrase. <laughs> Uh, now we're all just swearing like crazy. and <laughs> It's the boss. And the problem with the boss is not that the boss is actually an asshole, but the boss may be behaving like one because I don't believe in, in hanging labels on people. If you have career conversations with each of your people as a boss, you will get to know them a little better. And in the vast majority of cases, when you know people a little better, you like them a little more and you're less likely to behave like a jerk. Whereas if your only focus is the hierarchy and your place in the hierarchy, you are inevitably going to act like a jerk. And in this economy, in this environment, people will quit and we can't afford to have that right now. Such a great point. And if I hadn't said it myself, you said it even better. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to just bring in one more piece of data, then we'll wrap up and do our our tips. I want to bring in a recent study from EY Consulting, and I think it's really reiterating everything we're talking about here. 90% of U.S. workers believe empathetic leadership leads to higher job satisfaction. 79% agree it decreases employee turnover and that empathy could be the, quote, secret sauce to retaining and finding employees in the face of the great resignation. And I think what you're saying is really about being empathetic, being curious. What does this mean? Oh, Amy's, let me use a yoga reference. Like she'll get that. And so, you know, that to me is a sign of paying attention and listening and curiosity. So the question for you both is we also have been hearing from clients They are concerned that giving criticism, especially now, is going to demotivate people, right? So how, when managers are knowing, I need to lean in on the empathy and on the care, but gosh, if I say this criticism, now they're going to be demotivated and then they're going to leave. And I just, I I literally can't afford to have them leave. What tips do you have to help them avoid ruinous empathy? As Brene Brown, to quote another one of your heroes, Amy, says, and my hero as well, and probably Jason's, we all love Mm. Brene Brown. If it's clear, it's kind. It is so important to share with people 
the information that you might have that's going to help them do a better job and be more successful. That is the kindest thing that you can do for your employees if you're a manager. So there is nothing at all nice in the long run about ruinous empathy. I believe that empathy is a good thing, but we want to move towards compassionate candor, if you want to call it that, instead of radical candor. And if we go back to that Bob story, which I've told a thousand times, but I didn't give this guy Bob feedback and I didn't give him feedback and I didn't give him feedback. And eventually I had to fire him because he still wasn't doing a good enough job because I hadn't been giving him feedback. That was not nice. That was not nice. It was bad for me. It was much worse for Bob and it was bad for the whole team. And so I think remembering that what people want is for you to help them succeed in their careers and for you to help them succeed in their jobs. And remaining silent about mistakes that they are making is not nice. 100% agree. And I think it goes beyond just the mistakes. I'll share an example that I used in a workshop a, a little while back, which is managers are often most fearful of the situation in which an employee has something terrible going on. Maybe they're, they're, maybe they're going through cancer treatment or uh, there's a loved one who's ill or something terrible has happened. And they're not performing in their, in their job. Maybe they've taken advantage of everything that the company has to offer in terms of paid leave and all the other stuff, and they're not performing in their job. And they're like, I can't bring it, I can't bring it up. And I was like, why can't you bring it up? Why can't you, <laughs> why does it have to be two different things? Why can't you say, I know you're going through something incredibly difficult and I want to be as supportive as I can. Here are the things that we as the company can do that you haven't taken advantage of yet to support you as you go through this. But after we've exhausted those options, we need to have a conversation about how we can find a way to allow you to either continue to perform in this role or to find another role that might better fit where you are right now in your personal life or in your career. Having been on the other side of that, having you know, suffered with my own mental health issues and things like that, I think and been honest with that uh, with my you know, managers about it, I could tell that there were times when I was underperforming. And everybody was like walking on eggshells around me, like so afraid to say anything because they're like, oh, I don't want to contribute to to anything. And at the same time, I felt incredibly isolated <laughs> because I was just like, someone say, like, someone say something like that sucked. Though I'd like my performance. That meeting was awful. Like someone, please say something to me. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm further losing what's left of my mind. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I so agree with what you're saying, Jason. The, the kindest thing anyone ever did to me, shout out here for Shona Brown. I was, I had started a company. She was, uh, she was chair of the board and the company needed to shut down. And I wasn't admitting that to myself. I was, I had lost like 15% of my body weight and I hadn't slept. And and I walked into a meeting with her and she took one look at me and she said, Kim, you look horrible. You need to cancel all your meetings for the next two weeks and take care of yourself. And I was like, thank God she said that to me. I was so, I was, I was so grateful uh, for that. It was literally a lifesaver. Yeah, it's much better also than dealing with the fear that you'll be it'll be discovered. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the other thing. It's like <laughs> when we're not saying things in order for it to be in order for it to be an act of empathy or potentially an act of kindness, we have to assume that the other person isn't also worrying about these things. Like the the best thing you can do is like talk about the elephant in the room, bring it into the conversation, do it in a kind way to say I'm here. I want to work with you and figure out a way through this. I can't figure it out on my own and neither can you. So the only way we're going to figure this out is if we talk about what is getting in the way of you being successful and then collaborate to find a solution. And, you know, sometimes the solution is like helping that person find another job, right? It may no longer be the case that the job that they were in is the best fit for them. But that doesn't mean that what you can do for them has stopped. That's the other thing that I see managers. They're like, well, if this person can't do this job, then I've essentially doomed them to failure. It's like, no, like <laughs> you can help them find another job. A better job for thing. them. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. That That is a thing that you can do. And the couple of times that I've done that in my career, like I'm still in touch and have great relationships with people who I went through this process with. So I can tell you from experience that not only is it possible to do this 
uh, and to have there be a positive outcome when it all works out inside your company, it's even possible to have a positive outcome when it doesn't all work out inside the company and the person has to leave. I just want to say, hearing both of you share your stories and your vulnerability, this is part of why I love working with you and being part of Radical Candor. And I will just put a vote in, Kim. My version of it is um, kind is clear uh, and clear is kind. I go more for the kind is clear, but you've taught me a lot about going for clear is kind. So I'm working on <laughs> working on both of them with my yoga tree. So, and, and Jason, I do really appreciate you sharing. And I think that will help a lot of people and give people the courage to say the hard things from a place of really caring. So now it's time for our radical candor checklist tips you can use to start putting radical candor into practice. Number one, get to know each member of your team as a real live human being. And one of the kindest things you can do, thank you, Kim, for bringing in a yoga metaphor for me. So I welcome specific things that will relate to each person can go a long way. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Number two, have regular two-minute impromptu conversations with your team members. If you work remotely or you're a distributed team text them, ping them, ask them if they have two minutes to chat. It really makes a big difference when you have both formal and informal ways to check in throughout the week. Tip number three, have career conversations with each member of your team and revisit them once a year so you understand who is in rock star mode and who is in superstar mode and how that aligns with the work that they are doing. And then you can make little adjustments, little tiny adjustments like doing tree pose all year long. Okay, so for more tips, you can go to RadicalCandor.com backslash resources to download our learning guides for practicing Radical Candor. To see the show notes for this episode, go to RadicalCandor.com backslash podcast. Of course, if you like what you hear, please go ahead, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to order Kim's new book with its relatively new title, Just Work, How to Root Out Bias, Prejudice, and Bullying to Create a Kick-Ass Culture of Inclusion. Yes, it is available everywhere books are sold. The holidays are upon us. The Radical Candor store now open for business. Go to RadicalCandor.com. Click the shop link to get your Radical Candor swag. Bye for now. last, not by yet, last but certainly not least, I want to offer a little public praise to Brandy. Uh, We were number three in careers on Apple Podcasts, and I think that is really all thanks to the work that Brandy, who you all don't get to hear, but who is behind the scenes making this happen, uh, does. So thank you, Brandy. Thanks for joining us. Our podcast features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff, is produced by our director of content, Brandy Neal, and hosted by me, Amy Sandler. Music is by Cliff Goldmacher. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Candor and find us online at RadicalCandor.com.